politics and above religion, a moral authority exists known globally as the ageless wisdom. It is the study of consciousness, the mystery of awareness, which cannot be measured, yet will not be denied. Stay tuned as we explore consciousness, the fundamental nature of reality. Welcome to the Ageless Wisdom Mystery School with Michael Benner. And good afternoon. Welcome to KPFK and the Ageless Wisdom Mystery School. Heard every Tuesday at 1 o'clock on 90.7 FM here in Los Angeles and live streaming all around the world at kpfk.org. I'm really happy that you've joined us today. Another great program for you. Our guest has been with us before, but gosh, it was quite a while ago, maybe 14 or 15 years ago, I think. And she is Reverend Tasneem Fernandez, and she's here to talk to us about the Sufi tradition, which is Islamic, but it's also mystical, and it's beautiful. And besides being capital S Sufism, there's even a uh, general feeling among mystics around the world that there's a small s Sufism. It really applies to anybody who's looking for a personal experience of searching for truth that is finding their source and connecting in a very real way to an experience of the divine that which creates all that is every moment not something that happened once a long time ago but which is ongoing and unfolding uh, creation is an ever present and an eternal thing. And it's an absolute pleasure to have back with us and to welcome to the Ageless Wisdom, Reverend Tasneem Fernandez. Hello, Tasneem. Hello, Michael. Thank you for inviting me. Oh, I really appreciate uh, having you on the radio program again and uh, find our conversations to be fascinating. You're an American by birth. The name Fernandez suggests to me that at some point in your life, you discovered Islam. Why don't you tell us the backstory? How did you, how did you come to be a a Muslim and a Sufi, a seeker, um, and a teacher? First of all, I I was born in Mexico. Uh, I'm a naturalized American citizen, and very grateful to have had parents that were courageous. Really, uh, I'm I'm not using that as, you know, a way of building them up. I think it takes courage for any person to pull up roots. If, if you understand uprooting a plant, you know, a plant will die when it's uprooted. So the fact that, that people will uproot themselves from the place that nourishes them, from everything that they're familiar with, in order to make a, a, a trek uh, to travel, where they don't know where they're going. They don't know what they're going to meet. It's frightening. And yet the circumstances at home are so bad that you'll go into the unknown because of that. So I'm grateful to my parents. May they rest in peace for taking that journey and bringing us here. Um, sometimes I say to myself, and I, I repeat it out loud also when I'm asked that question, because I've in- investigated it myself, how in the world did I get here, right? Exactly. A, a little brown kid born in Mexico from poor parents, you know, uh, 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 18 and 19 year old uh, kids had had a baby and, you know, and I could have just stayed there. If they hadn't come, what would my life have been like in Mexico? I have no idea, of course. But I was a curious kid. And so I say that I was, I was born a mystic. It, it was the, the, this soul had a mystical inclination already. It arrived and it took this body and this, this seeking for that which... Uh, in the words of, of one of the great Sufi mystics, seeking that which is transpiring through that which appears, right? Here's the apparent, it looks like this, but I know there's something behind it. And it was just an inkling. It was, it was a hint that there might be more. And that's what drew me on and on. And I, I began my, my explorations for, I guess, for real, when I uh, left home and I moved to Hollywood and began... Uh, just looking around, and I found the Vedanta Temple, began going to the, um, the Sunday meetings and some of the Swami's lectures and 
uh, kirtan like that. It was very lovely. And then I took up yoga with Yogi Bhajan, who has uh, has now uh, become famous for establishing the 3HO um, Sikh community, uh, the 3H is standing for healthy, happy, holy. Uh, and so this was before the organization when uh, Yogi Bhajan had just come from India. So I was with one of his yoga students. And then I went to a lecture at the Manly Palmer Hall Philosophical Research Society. And the lecture was given by a man named uh, Pirzade Vilayat Khan, who was a Sufi master. And I, I never heard the word Sufi, so I, I didn't know what that was. But what attracted me was the topic he was speaking on was alchemy and the Kabbalah. And my name is Ermila, Tasnim Ermila Fernandez. And Ermila had always been a difficult name for me. Uh, certainly as a child, I hated it. I hated my name. Uh, my teacher made fun of it. Uh, kids couldn't say it, uh, you know, like that. So I searched out this name, and the closest I could come to was a possible association with Hermes. And that's where I started reading about alchemy uh, and hermetics and, uh, uh, you know, the, the emerald tablets, et, et cetera. Well, the man giving the talk, Pierre Vliet, became my teacher. He passed away now. Uh, gosh, my goodness. Has it been about 12, 12, 13 years he passed away? Pierre Vliet was my living teacher for 33 years in the Sufi uh, path. In the course of those years, I advanced, I suppose we could say I advanced, at least organizationally, uh, to take on responsibility for guiding others and conducting a center. Uh, uh, I've been ordained as a, as a minister of universal worship, which, which is our, I suppose you could call it our religious activity uh, in the Anaitia order. And this, this celebration of the unity of religious ideals is represented on a single altar by a scripture and a candle for each of the, the primary world's religions. There are, there are many, many, we know, but at least the primary ones. So we, we honor the Buddhist, the Hindu, the Zoroastrian, the Jewish, the Christian, the Islamic. And then we have a separate candle where we say for all those who, whether known or unknown to the world, have held aloft the light of truth, of whom we could we could count ourselves, Michael. You know, in in the ways that we recognize and realize whatever degree of truth, we stand for that, right? So we acknowledge that there have been many known and unknown. So it's not just these six. A person coming to a universal worship, maybe outside of any formal religion, would find hopefully some correspondence with a personal um, sense of values maybe even morality, God knows. So this is a way of demonstrating an inclusiveness, which is to be found, believe it or not, is to be found in Islam. I know that's a big surprise for, for many people. <clears throat> in the holy book of the, uh, of the Quran, uh, on a number, in a number of places, it, it states, even by name, the prophets of uh, Beni Israel, and it says we make no distinction among them. Uh, you know, David, Jethro, uh, Samuel, Elijah, Isaiah. I mean, name name the prophets. We don't make any distinction among them. Each of them was sent as a messenger with a particular duty, right? A message given to be uh, passed on to those for whom it was intended. So sometimes when we read the scriptures uh, from other religions, even from our own. And we don't understand, and we parse, and we uh, we take our, our red liner. You know, we all could cross that out and cross. Okay, this is an acceptable portion, and oh, I don't need to listen to this. I think that we don't take into account that the message was sent to a particular people, in a particular place, at a particular time, under under circumstances whereby the things that are said to them are applicable to what they're living. So for us to do that is to, in a sense, desecrate another's um, social and, and uh, spiritual experience, you know, uh, in any case. What I'm hoping is that through the universal worship and as well uh, the dances of universal peace, which are an outgrowth of this point of view of unity, people may find that after attending a service and they've heard 
are a, a selection that's been taken from, let's say, the Bhagavad Gita. And then they hear the words that were spoken by the Lord Buddha. And then they hear the selection uh, from, uh, from the Torah, let's say. And all along, the theme keeps repeating. So if the theme is compassion, they hear it through the words of Zarathustra, through the words of the Buddha, through the words of Jesus, through the words of Muhammad, peace be upon them all. And then that person who's, who's come with maybe no agenda, but just curiosity, comes away with a feeling that it spoke to them. Maybe not in the religious terminology that would limit their ability to hear the message across the board, but this is how we can come, God willing, we can come to some way of not just tolerating another, but embracing and accepting another's truth as valid for them. And this is a very Sufi point of view, to respect where another's soul is. We usually look, look at them as a personality, right? And then we get into characteristics and this and that. But this soul is responding to words that are uplifting to it. What business is that of yours, right? The guidance is for that soul. And so we respect where that soul is moving. I was interviewed recently by another radio host who asked me for my understanding of the difference between religion and spirituality. And uh, I wrestled with it for a few sentences and then found myself using the allegory of an ice cream store. And I said, imagine if you went into the your local favorite ice cream store and all they had was vanilla. And uh, you wanted strawberry or jomocham and fudge or or whatever, um, or maybe three scoops of a, of three different flavors. Why not? And I guess I feel that way about religion. Why should I limit myself because I love Jesus to not uh, exploring the teachings of the Buddha? or uh, the Quran, or the Upanishads, or, or Gita. Um, what do you suppose is behind this exclusivity that caused people to believe that they must choose only one religion? Oh, Michael. <laughs> I think the first thing is that we all believe that we are separate. We believe that we are separate from others, and separate, in fact, from God. This sense of separation makes us um, stick further to asserting our individuality. And in order to create an identity, we shore it up with our belief systems and our philosophies, you know, like that. Until that person is secure in themselves as a being that is not dependent on the external identifiers, that person will find it difficult to go outside of their prescribed range because they're still identified with being that one thing that is separate from others. When, um, and I'll, I'll use the example of, of uh, Christianity and a Christian, that if a Christian, and I'm just being theoretical here, if a person who follows the teachings of Christ Jesus, peace be upon him, and not only follows the teachings, but attempts to apply them, apply them in their daily life, and maybe even goes so far as to ask themselves, what would Jesus do? And I don't mean that in a flippant way. What would Jesus do? In this circumstances, that being, with that level of awareness and realization and God consciousness, what would that being do in this setting? Let me try and be that way. So to me, that is a person being a Christian, working, you know, working the material, being a Christian. When that Christian person has followed the teachings and applied the disciplines that are necessary to themselves, what will happen is their sense of self, a separate self, will become diminished they will take on more and more of the being uh, Christ-like. And Christ-like was loving and accepting of all beings, the high and the low, the sinner and the saint. When a person reaches that level of Christianity, they can be with a Jew, with a Muslim, with a Hindu, with an agnostic, with an atheist. It will matter not to them. It will not take one little 
iota of identification away from them. You see, it's fear that we, we keep others away from us because it shores up our own identity. But a mystic. I absolutely agree with that. I call it spiritual separation anxiety. <laughs> In psychology, we think of separation anxiety as a child uh, not bonding with mom or dad's unavailable emotionally or you know different forms of uh, not having access to each other. But a spiritual separation anxiety is just to feel like uh, I'm this block of matter bouncing around in a world of forms of blocks <laughs> and not really not really feeling the vibration and the energy the love and the light that uh, unifies all things i lived five years in hawaii and they have a saying they're all from the same rainbow uh -huh. many colors all from the same rainbow one light isn't that nice Let's take a short break. We'll have more. We're talking about Sufi mysticism with my guest, Reverend Tasneem Fernandez. This is the Ageless Wisdom Mystery School on KPFK, and we'll be right back after this. We're back with the Ageless Wisdom Mystery School on KPFK and talking today about Sufi mysticism with Reverend Tasneem Fernandez. Tasneem Meditation is a part of every mystical tradition. My guest last week talked about learning meditation from her Sufi parents when she was a little girl, and she said the technique she was taught was simply to stare into a candle, a single candle flame. And it reminded me, though we didn't get a chance to discuss it, of that uh, Sufi allegory about the moth to the flame. And I wasn't sure whether there was a connection there, but uh, why don't you talk a little about Sufi meditation and and maybe what that uh, moth to the flame allegory is really about? Or another one is the longing of the flute for the reed bed. Well, the the imagery from the Masnavi of Mevlana Jaladadin Rumi <clears throat> begins with those lines of the the wailing, uh, the the crying of the of the reed flute, and it's complaining about the pain that it's suffering because of the separation. It says, "Ever since I was cut off from my reed bed, my cries have set men and we men and women to weeping." It's describing the the condition of of the human being, cut off from its source, at least. It imagines that it is cut off from its source and the pain that that separation causes, such that it longs throughout its life to return to union. As far as the the imagery of the moth and, and the candle, that also is, is another uh, Sufi, much used uh, imagery among the poets. There's the attraction, just in the in the natural world, you'll see flies flittering around candle uh, candle flames. Well. There's this group of moths, and they want to know what is the secret in that flame? What is, what is the source of this light? And so they send out one of their uh, moth buddies to go check it out. And he gets near it, but it's so hot he comes back. He says, it's way too hot. I can't even get close to it. He says, no, no, you have to be more courageous. All right, someone else. And then they send another volunteer moth. Uh, this time, this moth goes a little bit closer, a little bit, and he, oops, he got a little singe on his wing. He says, I'm not getting closer than that. And he comes back. He says, look what happened to me. I got singed. I'm not going back there. So anyway, they, they send yet a third moth. And this moth has the heart, has the really heart. The moth goes. It surveys the flame all around. It comes in closer. It feels the heat, and it, and it takes on the singeing, and then it just plunges itself into the, into the flame. They're all wondering, what's he going to report? Well, there's nobody to report. Nobody came back from this. You don't come back from this. Gone, gone, gone. Let me share. Uh, the imagery is slightly different, but you'll, you'll get my meaning. This is called listen, oh, drop. D-R-O-P. Listen, oh, drop. Give yourself up without regret. And in exchange, gain 
the ocean. Listen, O oh drop, bestow upon yourself this honor, and in the arms of the sea be secure. Who indeed should be so fortunate? An ocean wooing a drop. In God's name, in God's name, sell and buy at once. Give a drop and take the sea full of pearls. You mentioned ancient Egyptian hermetic philosophy early in our interview today, and it reminds me that there's a similar allegory about the way an athenor is used to get gold out of ore by burning off the dross, the impurities, and it takes incredible heat over a prolonged period for all those impurities to be burned away, but then what you're left with is pure gold. And once again, we're talking three, 4,000 years ago, these alchemists saw the allegory. They got the metaphor that we have to shed this ego, this false uh, separated sense of self in order to begin to experience the harmony and then the union that is our eternal existence is energy or is spirit. And uh, I used to tell my students to buy high school textbooks on uh, electromagnetism and begin to get familiar with magnetism and electricity because while in spiritual or religious traditions, we may use the word spirit, which means breath, but this is energy. And Einstein proved, and others as well, that all that appears to be material and solid is actually a, this beautiful dance of, of energy, that the solid appearance is just that, an illusion, but that the energy is eternal and cannot be destroyed. And that's who and what we are. And we we have the science. Quantum physics is 100 years old. We ought to be able to blend science and spirituality. There's no conflict here. I think if your sense of spirituality or religion conflicts with science, you need to back off and take another look. It's, it's not that religion is wrong. It just may be that you're misinterpreting it. Could be, yeah. And are not scientists seekers after truth, you know? So it may be that simple at, at the surface, this whole idea. But of course, you said fear is the problem, and it's scary to move into anything unknown and to give up this sense of I, me, mine. I don't miss it. it. I haven't completely shed my ego. It rushes forward to take credit for all kinds of <laughs> all kinds of things in my life. It's It's always lurking just over my shoulder, ready to jump forth and be prideful, you know. But uh, even if I get a compliment about how spiritual this uh, discussion may be, my ego's there to take credit for that too. What an irony. You know, it, it, it'll dress up like it's the soul, and there's all this glamour that we encounter sometimes in spirituality. Oh, aren't I holy? Aren't, aren't I better than you because I'm... Well, it's just an absurd paradox, isn't it? He goes a wily character, isn't it? <laughs> Would you mind, Michael, if I, if I shared another poem? You, what, something you just said just stirred me. When you said, you know, we, we take credit for this and that and the other thing. Uh, our, our ego uh, puffs up. This is, this is one of my favorite poems. I use it a lot in, in my workshops, you know, when applicable, but it's almost always applicable. It's called Borrowed Clothes. And this one is uh, from the Masnavi of Mevlana Rumi. Borrowed clothes. That servant for whom the world lovingly wept, the world now rejects. What did he do wrong? His crime was that he put on borrowed clothes and pretended he owned them. We took them back in order that he may know for sure that the stock is ours and the well-dressed are only borrowers, that he may know that those robes were a loan 
a ray from the sun of being. All that beauty, power, virtue, and excellence have arrived here from the sun of excellence. They, the light of the sun, turn back again like stars from these bodily walls. When the sunbeam has returned home, every wall is left darkened and black. That which amazed you in the faces of the fair is the light of the sun reflected in the three colored glass. The glasses of diverse hue cause the light to assume color for us. When the many colored glasses are no longer, then the colorless light amazes you. Make it your habit to behold the light without the glass so that when the glass is shattered, you may not be left blind. Well, it's beautiful. Very provocative, though. Could spend quite a bit of time reflecting on that. Exactly. And, and that's the point. That's the point of, of much of Hazrat Mevlana's works. And you re, we, one realizes that the Masnavi is six books. You know, it's six volumes, the Masnavi. And from these six volumes, people have extracted uh, portions and uh, translated and then made versions of them like that. And we have them in, in little collections of, of uh, Rumi poetry. But in, in some cases, and, and sometimes to their detriment, they're taken out of context. The story is still beautiful. It still says something to you, but it's missing something of its wholeness because it's been pulled out of its context. In the Masnavi of Hazrat Mevlana Rumi, the story before the one that you're reading and the one after the one that you're reading will inform the one, even the one after will inform the one that you're currently reading. And so to take a piece of that out, as I say, it still is, is beautiful and can be presented and it speaks to us, but it's out of context. Another thing, and I'll, I'll stop with this, uh, that has happened with uh, some of these extractions uh, and, and lovely versions that have been offered to, to the public is that they have been de-Islamicized. Hasuti Mevlana Rumi obviously was a Muslim. And the, the whole of this six volumes of the Masnavi is considered, for instance, in Iran, by, by the Persians, it is referred to as the Quran in Persian. I mean, what a thing to say, right? That the Masnavi is the Quran in Persian. Because there is so much of the Quran and so much of, of Hadith that if you know the Quran, you're reading the Quran when you read the, the Masnavi. I mean, I'm really talking esoteric stuff here. Um, but just so you know that there's, there's more, there's more than, than, than what we hear uh, in, in the first blush of a poem. Well, the Middle Eastern culture in general, what we call Iraq, there is no Iraq. Right. You know, the British put together <laughs> three, three tribes, basically, and called it Iraq. Um, but I'm not sure many Westerners appreciate, unless they're scholarly, how much of ancient Western philosophy, uh, Greek philosophy, the ancient Greeks, uh, Aristotle and Socrates, was kept alive by Middle Eastern scholars during Europe's Dark Ages. A thousand years or more of people digging in the dirt, having no idea how to read, uh, repressed in many ways by the religion of the times, uh, discouraged from learning to read, not allowed to read holy books or the great philosophers. And thank goodness the the Middle Eastern philosophers were studying these ancient Greeks. And even our concept of a romantic love comes from, you know, the tales of the Arabian Nights. And this is such a beautiful culture. And then somebody stumbles onto Rumi in high school and, and Hafiz and these other great poets. And eventually it leads to what I think is best termed Sufism, which is the uh, the mysticism that does not stand alone, but unites East, Middle East, and West. And you can see the overlap when you study it. And especially if you, if you honor that, uh, what shall I say, that inclusivity, that overlap, that 
that melding or or blending of understanding. It, it can be an absolutely thrilling experience to see what you learned in a rigid religious context expanded to embrace all religions and so much more, all philosophy, all science. And then you start to look at people who you thought were other than or different from you and see they are simply you in borrowed clothes. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Tell me more about the meditation. I want to know, how, how do you teach your students? I mean, beside reflecting on scripture and contemplating poetry and and the dilemmas that come up in our daily life and affairs, what kind of practice is a Sufi likely to learn at the beginning for meditation? Probably the first is a breath practice. Breathing practice. Um, Can you explain that a little? The most, the most elementary would be simply to observe your breathing, and and be aware that you are breathing. You know, to be, to make it a conscious action. Watching the breath, inhaling, watching yourself exhaling. It's so it's it's a watching, a, a an observation practice, right? Seeing the breath come and seeing the breath go. To which, and there's any number of uh, varieties of practice could be given with that. One might be, uh, let's say, to create more balance and rhythmic, um, rhythmic balance in, in the being, in the person. To find the pulse, <clears throat> the pulse beat, and then to begin counting the pulses and breathing so that for, let's say, four beats or eight beats of, of, your, of your pulse, you inhale and then you exhale for eight, inhale for eight, exhale for eight, inhale for eight, like that. So it begins slowly to bring rhythm into the system. Right? This is on the just physical level. We're not imagining light or invoking angels or anything. We're just watching the breath as it is breathing. And then one can add a further thought which is from where did this breath come and where does it go? So as we take in that breath and to reach for, where does it come from? And my lungs are filled and have to breathe out. The breath goes out. Where did it go? When I breathe in, what does this breath carry to me? After I have breathed this breath, it has entered me, circulated throughout my system, and I breathe out. What does this out breath carry out? And if the first stages of almost any uh, religious or spiritual discipline uh, have to do with purification, then we might say that what we are receiving is a pure breath, unqualified, unconditioned, uncategorized, unnamed, like that. It's, it's a pure breath. We receive a pure breath. This purity circulates within reminds ourselves of our original purity and gently removes impurities as we breathe out. We could do that for several sessions or for some time. It depends on the condition of the person before adding another concentration. <clears throat> so it's, you see, it's even though we're saying we're doing a breathing practice, which we are, we are at the same time beginning to inculcate the ability to hold a thought or, or hold a process in the mind or learning to concentrate. If we are not interested, that's the first thing. If it doesn't interest you, you might still do the practice, but it hasn't got you, right? So we assume that there's already this, this questing within the soul. The interest is there in order to apply itself to the discipline of doing what could be boring. For some people, it's like, yeah, breathe in, breathe out, haha, you know, there's nothing here. Okay, now, this same same simple little practice can transform. As we're taking that breath in, from where does this breath come? <sighs> from the source of all, right? In Arabic, it would be called the, 
the, the nafs, by the way, this, this word refers to the self, the nafs, or the ego, the self, or the soul, or the breath, as you've said. So this nafs, referring to the divine nafs, would be the, the nafas rahman. Rahman is a name of God for mercy. So it is this unending outpouring of mercy that comes to us in every breath. It is a mercy that we receive with every breath that continues to endow the organism with life. So as we become more conscious of where this breath is coming and the gift that it is, this dispensation of life, it may generate uh, a response of gratitude, of gratefulness, of awfulness, of, uh, uh, well, whatever it, it generates. And what do, we, what do we realize has been standing in the way of this gratitude? Well, I thought that everything that I did, it was through my own efforts and my own will, you know, my willpower accomplished this. And to let go of that, that claiming that I did something, that I accomplished something, that I decided something, and let it be in the hands of the creator, then we come back to that poem of the drop. Oh, drop, give yourself up. And in exchange, to take the ocean full of pearls. It's, that's the fear. I am a drop. I am identified with being a drop. What would happen to me if I, okay, I've come to the shore. Here comes the big waves. What happens if I drop in? How, how will I find myself again in this massive body of water? I never will. Exactly, because you will have been transformed. It's odd that we have to remind ourselves and given the opportunity, each other, that something, uh, uh, an idea as simple as giving up self-interest in favor of the greater good is not what it appears to be, for we are part of that greater good. So you're not really losing <laughs> anything by shedding self-interest. You're just expanding the sense of what is self until nothing is excluded, and you end up with the one life, the one thing, the one self, I guess, but self implies separate. And if only we could, and I think breath meditation is a great way to begin to develop non-attachment from the monkey mind, that we identify with these uh, thoughts that are racing around in our brains to, to apply our thinking to a particular task, to read, to set a goal, to make a decision, to solve a problem. That's one thing. But when we just, you know, have nothing that needs to be understood or no task that needs to be accomplished, and we just put our feet up and stare out the window, we've still got the mind's own agenda, churning out all of this nonsense, a lot of it negative and self-loathing. And we believe that's us thinking. That's not us. That's the brain's own agenda or the unconscious mind, if whatever label you want to hang on it. But that's not me. I, I'd rather practice being the awareness of that than being the thinker. I'm tired of being the thinker. Too much, <laughs> it's too much work. I'd rather... I'll think when I need to think, I'll feel when I need to feel, but to practice, even if just 10 or 15 minutes a day, being non-judgmental and witnessing that process without being seduced into participating in the argument, that's one of my goals. Yes. I was thinking about uh, two terms that are used in, in the lexicon of Sufism, I guess we call it. Uh, which are fana and baka, these two words, fana and baka. Fana, uh, to make it simple, would be annihilation or, or submission or, or death, doing away, passing away, fana. And the second one, baka, B-A-Q-A, -A, baka, is abiding, remaining, um, that which is eternal, we could say. So one thing is temporal and passing, and the other is established and permanent. This is probably the, the, the principal practice across all Sufi orders, all Sufi orders, no matter where or, for, or, or from guided from whom, 
is the practice of remembrance of, of dhikr, what's called dhikr or zikr. Dhikr Allah, the remembrance of Allah. Dhikr Allah has these two um, sections, the fana and the baka. The first half says, la ilaha. There is no divinity, there's no reality, there's no God, there's no deity. That, la ilaha, there is nothing, if you like. La ilaha, there's no divinity. Illa, except Allah. And Allah, though it's translated God, and then God, at least for us, is almost always gendered as, as, as masculine. The, the abiding, the la ilaha illa law, necessarily requires a diminishment, again, of one's personal identity, right? Well, if there is nothing except that, that we'll just call it the haq, we'll just call it the reality. If there is nothing except that reality, and nothing is outside of it, and nothing is partnered with it, then I'm part of that too. I am not separate from it, and neither is anyone else. We come back to that, that place of respecting the soul and the soul's relationship to its creator, which is personal and intimate. I have no business butting into the intimate relationship between God and another soul on a certain level, if, if you, you know what I mean, as far as being respectful. If I've been given permission to work with someone, then I may step in and help guide or make a correction or whatever. But you see, another of these great little sayings is that a Sufi can only go where they're invited. So if someone invites my opinion, then I will give my opinion, but it, or it invite, invites my advice or uh, my counsel, what should I do? If they ask me, then I might have something to say, but you know, to just come and say, you know what you ought to do, <laughs> as we all often do to each other, uh, it's, it's an imposition. Uh, and it, it could be helpful, but we never know. Tasneem, I know you see private students, you're an instructor and a teacher. How can people get more information about you if they feel moved to follow up on this uh, interview? What's the best way to get a hold of you? Um, I'll give my email, which is my name, T-A-S-N-I-M-F at A-O-L dot com uh, through an email, and then we could correspond. I see people in person now a little bit outside, masked, you know, at a distance, uh, but we would probably start with a, uh, an email and, and maybe a phone call. Reverend Tasneem Fernandez, my guest today on The Ageless Wisdom. Tasneem, thank you, dear. Thank you so much. It's a great pleasure, Michael. I'm so happy to see you and to be with you and to have this chance to talk with someone uh, with whom I can talk. Alhamdulillah. Thank you so much, Michael. <laughs> I feel the same way. It's been a joy. And uh, I hope we can all come outside and play soon. And uh, <laughs> I miss handshakes and hugs and smiles and twinkling eyes and laughter and song. And I think it's been hard on us. I think harder on many of us than we even realize. But uh, human pleasures. No rain, no rainbows, right? Right, right. I, I wanted to apologize if, if anything that I've said, sometimes it's just, you know, extemporaneously speaking. Um, I meant no disrespect to anyone or to their beliefs. Well, thank you. I don't think that's going to be a problem, but I appreciate you saying that. And have a blessed day, and uh, uh, thanks again. Thank you. Join us next Tuesday, every Tuesday at 1 o'clock in the afternoon. For those who listen on the Internet, that's 20 hours universal time for the Ageless Wisdom Mystery School. Besides this broadcast, we stream at theagelesswisdom.com. We also podcast for the world. You can search it on any podcast platform as The Ageless Wisdom or Ageless Wisdom Mystery School. Check out my website at michaelbenner.com. And as always, be gentle, love life, and take care of each other. From KPFK in Los Angeles, this is Michael Miller. So long.